Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Stella, you still hear us? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you have any questions uh, to one of the panelists? Any statements? Any questions of clar clarification? Of one? Hello, uh, my name is Nina Renarding. I'm working for the Bonn International Center for Conversion. Um, and I would like to address the question to Michael Coy, but I think it's also relevant to the two other panelists. And because you framed the, the dilemma between modernization and stability, and I would rather frame it as a, as a conflict between different definition of development, between development on a national level and economic development model, and the more, in my opinion, more sustainable human development aspect. So, what do you think about this? And could this, if we were to reframe the debate in this, this aspect, would that help um, in proceed with this debate? Thank you very much. I think we collect uh, some questions. Mm -hmm. My name is Uli Brandt from Vienna University. Hello, Martin Stella. Um, I have a question to, for. Um, how is the, the um, analysis uh, Maristela and Martin um, gives us on the resource extractivism as a development model, which does not mean just the economic activities, but that the state structures, the public discourses, the national popular, as Maristela says, the class structures, the understandings of progress, of well-being, are so linked to these economic, ecological activities would you say that this is also um, a move in Myanmar? Because I just read an article that now the textile industry comes to Myanmar from Bangladesh, from, uh, from Cambodia. So what is, um, would you think that for, for Myanmar the thesis that it's a development model is, um, does make sense? And the new languages, as Maris Dela also said, the new languages, um, when there are resistances, whether well, they are new languages of territories, a revalorization of territories. And the second point, especially to Martin, but also we might um, reflect in a broader framework. You said in your six thesis that there's a contradiction between um, extractivism and sustainability, and that there are many sustainability uh, initiatives. And I asked myself, and we have some papers also in, um, in, the, in the concrete sessions, whether sustainability the, not only the discourse, but the practice of sustainability, the, with the initiatives you are referring to, become part of the first. That there's not a contradiction. We say in Latin America, there was a struggle between the extractivistas and the pachamamistas. The extractivistas, those who go for extraction, and the pachamamistas, those who tried to, 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 um, to uh, protect Mother Earth, pachamama, but in the very strong sustainability sense. And now, as you say, the Currently, I hope it will change, of course, currently the game is on, in the, uh, on the side of the extractivists. But the danger, I would say, is that the sustainability discourse and the practices are kind of integrated into this extractivist perspective. Thank you. Um, there is a question also here. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Michael Schmidlener. I actually live in, uh, in Brazil in Acre. And I, uh, my, actually my question was uh, very close to this what Uli Brandt just said, uh, because I don't see it as a dilemma, really, between growth and sustainability in, uh, in, Brazilian, uh, in the Brazilian government, uh, mainly. Because uh, if you look, for instance, yeah, uh, f at the new forest code, this law, yeah, uh, and you <coughs> mentioned the Cadastro Rural Ambiental, actually it aims at uh, compensation deals. Uh, it, is, it establishes a new kind of share, uh, uh, and uh, the, the politics will change. Uh, the, what the Forest Code does is a change from a restoration uh, policy to a compensation policy. So, uh, what happens? It's actually a step further to this uh, green economy strategies, uh, which actually do not really aim. Uh, restoration, but just uh, uh, compensation deals, where there are other interests involved, mainly of financial capital. So, actually, uh, I think this is something we have to be very careful 
uh, to analyze this discourse, this green discourse that comes uh, from Brazil. Uh, thank you. I think we take two more comments in this first round. There was a guy in the back. <coughs> Hi, my name is Gordon Crawford from the University of Leeds in the UK. Uh, a, a question, sort of, first of all, directed to uh, Kim Zawi. And um, I was very interested in, in, in what you had to say about Myanmar as a late starter and uh, there still being this opportunity for uh, development decisions to, uh, to be made. Um, but also, you talked about democracy not being the, the solution and uh, the sort of expectations of the democratic transition having been, um, uh, those expectations not being fulfilled so far and political parties being weak, etc. So I was wondering, you know, so what are the processes by which development policy options can be discussed and, uh, and determined if, if not through uh, those uh, sort of formal democratic processes? And also, that leads me to think, do, do we need to have to think about different forms of democracy rather than the, sort of the, the standard liberal democracy model? Um, are there sort of more participatory forms of democracy that could be, um, could be examined and, and explored? And then following up from that, sort of, uh, a question to the, to the other two speakers, to, to Marastrea and to, to Martin, in terms of the experiences from, from Latin America, are there sort of uh, more participatory forms of democracy in, in Latin America that uh, can, can Myanmar benefit from, from those experiences? Thank you. Okay, then we we'll take another question here. From Cornelia. Hi, my name is Cornelia Schwarz from the Austrian Foundation Relevant Research here. Um, I want to have a question somehow linked to what um, Oli um, asked. I mean, you, about different development models and development debates, I mean, you said, you talked about the attractivist, attractivistas, then you call, talked about the, uh, which I haven't heard, the um, Bachamamistas, but also at least globally in some countries, there's an increasing um, debate again on the role of industrial development, industrialization, industrial policies, debated quite a lot in many countries, and also in some Latin American countries like, um, like Brazil. So I would call them the industrialistas. So if you have these three debates or development models, how would you all um, three see what are the contradictions or also the, the linkages and also the dominance between these three debates and, and development um, models? Thank you very much. We will make a second round of questions, but I think it's uh, good at this point to give uh, our speakers the possibility to uh, react or to answer these questions. Uh, I think uh, I would like to start with uh, Mr. Kim Sawin. And so, so basically, our question is what would these experiences in Latin America help uh, for uh, Myanmar case and also this question on uh, democracy uh, with regard to resources? So, uh, thank you very much for the questions. Uh, as I will on the development models, I will answer all the three questions uh, together. Uh, as I have alluded to in my presentation, it's not so much, I think, uh, uh, ignorance of the presence of uh, development models, but they are not articulated enough. You know? There was an Indian scholar who once asked me, how long is Myanmar's transition going to take? You know, it's been going on for decades. And people are just immersed in kind of a, a single track issue. And that's why I said about, mentioned the, uh, the weakness of the democratic parties. You know. All these, the, the richness of this kind of debate simply does not happen. You know. It's sometimes um, hard to understand for people like you and incredible, but uh, we are very much on a single track path. You know. uh, the, the Western press, for instance, plays this up. Um, will you really ask some of the major opposition parties what is your economic policy, what is your economic platform, what is your development policy? You probably come up with a blank, you know, I'm sorry to say, you see. And that is exactly the point that I was trying to make. Uh, Latin America, I know that, uh, presents uh, 
very rich alternatives. And I think uh, some of the friends who've been, like our friends here on the front row who've been uh, speaking in Myanmar would have realized this. You speak to uh, little audiences. But I think it has to reach out much more broadly, you know. Uh, and that's not happening at the moment. So I think it's also incumbent upon people like us here to really uh, spread, let's say, to so to speak, uh, the argument and the debate and the discussions further so that people will understand. Right? On the uh, uh, issue of demo uh, democratic parties, which our friend mm -hmm. asked you, is linked to what I've said, you know. Um, it's not a disappointment in democracy per se, it's the vehicles of democracy. We had expected so much of them, and when the right moment came, I mean, it is a disappointment, as, as I have said. So yes, and it's in a way a very much an elitist democracy. So much attention on parliament, so much attention on the elections. When I was doing these um, rural um, public consultations, on the uh, land use policy, I go back to the villages. They happen in Buddhist monasteries. And one of the questions that I can ask is that, why are you explaining this to us? What are the parties doing? What are the parliamentarians doing? Are they asleep? That's what the rural people ask me, you know? And that is the gap that exists. I explain it to the rural population because this is a chance, no matter what the content is. Yes, you could ask a very valid question, what are the political parties doing? Are they aware of this national land use policy, even? You know? So yes, I think we should have more uh, participatory <coughs> democracy, as they call it. It's not only in Myanmar, but I think in other parts of Asia as well. I think this was articulated uh, in the past in Bangladesh, in India, you know, and even in East Asia, that uh, you know, democracy is only seen as electoral democracy, as you know it, you know, and it only happens during elections after that everything dies down and uh, people uh, forget about it. And uh, I would say that uh, I think uh, we are on the, um, let's say, on the cusp in Myanmar. That there, if there is a real committed search for the most uh, suitable development model at this time, I think it would bear a lot of fruit. So that's why I said these things have to be really deeply articulated and a more committed search uh, needs to be done. Thank you very much. I think I would like to go on with Maristella. Is that okay for you? Yes. Sorry, but this is not possible to answer for me. Yeah, I, so there was... I can't understand the question. The sound is too far. Yeah, yeah. Um, there was a question on these uh, different development models, like a model more a developmentalist, uh, extractivist model, a model more based more on sustainability, but also a model based on industrialization. And so what would be, what do you think are the differences and contradictions, uh, if I got it right, uh, from these uh, different development models, because the question was, there was uh, only talk about extractivism and kind of sustainability, but what is with uh, industrialization uh, as a third uh, development model uh, that is that could uh, emerge again? Okay. 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 I was wondering of the question about the differences between industrialization and extractivism, because uh, in Latin America it was a, a, a strong uh, discourse about industrialization. Uh, for example, the ECLAC, ECLAC uh, is the Economic Commission of Latin American countries, uh, uh, mm, develop a, a, a strong uh, discourse of uh, industrialization and at the moment, for example, in UNASUR, the last year, in June uh, um, 2013, in Venezuela, uh, in Clark uh, talked about the strategic relationship, relationship with China and uh, the um, objective in Latin America, the, the economic objective as of 
is sorry, the industrialization of the uh, natural resources. But uh, the question is, uh, if that is the only record, is not a, 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 in fact, is the practice uh, is a, a extractivist, uh, is not uh, uh, an, uh, is, is not a strategy, is not uh, industrialistic uh, strategy. Uh, maybe there is uh, some uh, something about the soil model because the soil model. Uh, for example, I think in Argentina or in Brazil, it's a complex system. It's not a simple uh, a, a model, like mining, for example, uh, including uh, hydrocarbons, uh, because the soil model has uh, a service industry uh, very important in Argentina and in Brazil. But the tendency, the tendency is uh, to reinforce the strategies, uh, practices. But this, the discourse is even when you, you listen uh, uh, Dilma Rousseff or uh, uh, Cristina Fernández de Kirchner, it's an industrialist discourse. So there is a, a disconnection between uh, discourses and, uh, and fact. Uh, but it is very important this uh, this record uh, because uh, it declared another uh, another organism in Latin America support this uh, uh, this narrative of development and, and this narrative of development is not only in the progressive government but in the conserv conservative government. That is to say, there is, a, there is a connection between this narrative and, uh, the, and the, the neoliberal narrative. Uh, because it's not only the, the question about the industrialization of the natural resources, but uh, social uh, action uh, for the enterprise, uh, governance, um, and the other topics that is the center of the uh, dispositive of domination. Okay? Thank you I don't much. know if it's clear. Finally, uh, Martin Coy, you would like to uh, address some of these questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so there were several questions concerning the paradox or dichotomy or whatever, modernization, sustainability, or so is that the right uh, positioning of this question or do we have a new uh, model of development and, 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 and logic, an inherent logic of that. So you, in a certain sense all these questions um, touch to a point where myself this morning I thought how should I address this because I'm not very sure about that. So that is certainly a weak point for me and a point where I'm st still reflectioning about. Um, my, my, my answer will not be a, let's say, a theoretic one, but much more a personal or a historical one. Um, some weeks ago I had the opportunity in a workshop in Manaus to discuss with several people from, the, from several ministries in Brasilia about the land policy and the environmental governance in Amazonia. People who are, uh, that was exactly on the day of the first round of the elections and all those people were, uh, um, so they were a little bit angry about their, um, their own future and so perhaps they uh, tended to reflect on their positions before that in other days. But it was very, I, I think it is interesting to look, let's say, or to, to go down from a very general global interpretation and that is I think you are absolutely right but then to go perhaps more to the to the um, contradictions to the shifts in 
and, and positions of people, of discourses within the government, what do they do, what is the, what is the, the, the consequence on the local, local scale of certain policies and so. And therefore I still maintain a little bit that idea of two positions, of a modernization position and a sustainability position, because I think they are until now struggling in concrete policies uh, at the local and regional level. So you still have, um, uh, when, you, when you look back in the Brazilian case to the first um, mandate of the Lula government with a lot of people coming from the civil, civil society organization into the government, how they try to, to, to let's say, um, strengthen um, uh, uh, environmental policies and so so we all know that this that we have we we, we just uh, um, uh, observe uh, during the last years uh, 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 roll back to other forms of polit policies that is very clear but you still have those some of those people trying to to realize let's say for instance in programs like the Terra Legal program or in my in my interpretation with instruments like the CAR as well um, other or alternative ways to regulate um, excess and domination over uh, resources. Perhaps there is a, a certain naive point or, or, or vision to, to uh, uh, of, of thinking that those politics could per, policies could perhaps um, uh, come to a positive end, but uh, so that I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, um, and I'm, ob I'm observing that um, that the modernization idea and all that is uh, gaining more and more um, importance. But I think um, the realities on the ground today are much more complicated than. The, the, the simple opposition of one thing to another thing. And therefore, I'm, um, I'm not sure if the struggle between those um, different positions is yet the decision that we have a new development model in one direction. So that is what I, I would say. Um, and, and only one uh, short remark to, uh, I don't know, to the idea or to, to, the que to your question what um, Myanmar can, per, could perhaps learn from, from participatory experiences. I think um, there the answer probably is more or less the same because um, the, let's say the, the, the more euphoric, euphoric uh, yeah, a positive uh, perception of uh, participatory processes in in, 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 in Brazil, for instance, um, so the, the evalua evaluation of that today would be slightly different. Um, so taking, for instance, some hot spots of development um, as, for instance, the plan of uh, sustainable development for a new export corridor, which is the uh, um, um, uh, highway uh, from the state of Mato Grosso to to the Amazon to export soybean from the center west, uh, more economic uh, form. So in the beginning there was a, an idea of a participatory process and a lot of civil society organizations positioned themselves to participate in it. But then with the PAC programs in 2007 and 8, this participatory idea uh, died. And so there is a certain um, Yes, this is Katzenjammer. I don't know. So there is a certain Katzenjammer what uh, participatory processes in Brazil are concerned, I think. Yes. Um, just to make my response a bit more, a bit more complete, uh, uh, president, president of Myanmar thinks saying, well, yes, three years ago enacted a series of reforms, but in agriculture, especially, I think. Uh, it has been criticized as very neoliberal. You know? What I see is that, okay, uh, if extractivism is clearly articulated, I'm sure there'll be a lot of resistance to that. You know? But what are the alternatives? 
we haven't had enough debate on that. What we see now in Myanmar is that, okay, a lot of dissatisfaction with the extractivist model as developments, but um, the responses, if you can call them that, are more piecemeal and kind of ad hoc. You know? Ad hoc sense, okay, we're not going to extract logs and we're going to add value to that. You know? It's also very small, tiny, piecemeal solution. So I think in a gathering like this, I think uh, it's also part of the uh, search for answers. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this first round. I think we don't have a lot of time, but I would like to uh, open the floor uh, for final uh, questions. There was one here. My name is Lena Patsch, I'm from the University of Freiburg in Germany. And um, <laughs> Kinzog, then I became really cautious when you said you need political uh, external assistance for formulating policy proposals and so on. So I wonder who are these uh, people who assist you? Uh, because I'm really afraid that they are just the people who assisted all other countries and that you are on the direct pathway to what we call new extractivism. And also, this is a comment to all the people in the room, maybe we should not only talk about discourses and reflect upon discourses, but also come up with suggestions for people like you <laughs> in the concrete uh, situation, how we can actually formulate different model models. I was waiting there, you stand in the back. Yeah. From behind. <laughs> my, name is, my name is Lawrence eBay from Vesso Mini, Germany. Uh, the talk given by Martin Ko is quite interesting, especially the first part where he talked about the framing of resource uh, conflict or resource extraction. Uh, my question is, um, as a geographer, how do you resolve the issue of the multiscalar nature of resource extraction? And um, how can you also link resource extraction, conflict, and sustainability issues. Thank you. And we have another question here. Yeah. Second. Hello, uh, my name is Axel Andorf. I'm a master graduate from the Global Studies program in Leipzig in Roskilde. And I have a question to Maristella Swampa and Martin Koy because you talked about the increasing resource extraction since uh, 2007, 2008. And I wanted to ask how far do you see that link to the global economic and financial crisis occurring at the same time? Because uh, I would argue that essentially it's a crisis of overaccumulation and surplus capital is seeking new areas of investment and the, the valorization of nature is essentially one um, area of new investment, so to say, which we can see in the transnational uh, financial capital um, active in these extractive pro projects. And even if we have this issue of the financialization of nature in the article about Ulrich Brandt, um, How's it called? Financialization of nature as a crisis strategy. And yeah, yeah. Two more questions. Uh, Isabella in the back. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> uh, my name is Isabella Ratua. I have a question for better understanding the reality in Myanmar. When we're talking about the extractivist development model, I think one very implicit dimension is the colonial dimension and coloniality of power through racial relations and asymmetrical uh, power relations in global political economy. And I've specifically studied Bolivia and Ecuador, and there peasant and indigenous organizations articulated very specific projects for decolonization, such as the demand for deepening intercultural democracies. And I would be interested if this is relevant, if this is debated, and if there are such proposals in Myanmar. Now we take one uh, last question. Yeah, I'm sorry that we can't take all of the questions, but they will be. Uh, Thank yeah. you for Kakabungi from Carleton University. Uh, this is not a question, that's just a comment that may contribute to the debate. And I'm speaking from the perspective of African countries that are richly endowed with natural resources on one side. On the other hand, imagine that 
development needs are very huge in those countries and their own employment are minerals. So I don't really see that there should be a, we should be talking about conflict between algos, development models and resource extraction. I see the problem and from a development perspective that take the case of the DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo, that is emerging from a civil war of more than 10 years. Take the case of Angola, which has a lot of oil and diamond, emerging from conflict more than 25 years. So in those countries, development needs are very huge. What do they have? Natural resources. So we should be thinking in terms of what kind of policy is there to ensure that current generation and future generations benefit from natural resources. It's a problem for me, and that's my own opinion, that we should be examining whether there is a long-term vision arising from the governance of natural resources. And you can see that from those countries that have succeeded, like Botswana, initially they were able to develop a long-term vision so that everyone can benefit from natural resources. I think that is the, the question we should be examining. Thinking in terms of conflict between different models and extractivism can mislead from a development policy perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, start with uh, Maristella uh, and the question uh, directed to you was actually how uh, is the how is extractivism in Latin America actually linked to the global financial crisis? if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on this. So how is extractivism in Latin America linked to the global economic or the global financial crisis? What is the connection? That is the answer, uh, that is the question to you. So if you, would you like to elaborate on this? Uh, in a, there are many many answers uh, because it's not simple to, to answer that. But in 2008, 2009, when the financial uh, crisis in the, in, in, in the world, uh, it was uh, to the uh, a big moment of the super cycle of commodities. So many countries in Latin America uh, didn't suffer a, a strong crisis, a financial crisis, uh, because it was a good, a very good moment uh, in terms of the advantages, uh, comparative advantages. Okay, uh, maybe at the moment is uh, more important because uh, it's uh, apparently. Uh, of the recent people that we talk uh, the end of the super cycle of commodities. Okay? Uh, so um, I don't think that it was uh, it, it was important but the, the impact in Latin America is not uh, very strong. Uh, I, I don't know if, if, if it was more like, but I, I can I can add another thing as possible. No, because uh, um, Martin Coy uh, spoke about the conflict of territoriality and uh, the superposition uh, between different uh, logics of territoriality. And it's true, there is a logic of the state, there is another logic uh, from the enterprises, uh, and there is another logic of the social organization. Uh, but uh, the, for me, the, the, the the most important question is the asymmetry of power, and uh, the and the other question is there is not uh, a consultation to the indigenous people or to the population in general uh, about this uh, mega project. And when, uh, if there is a consultation, uh, frequently there is a manipulation uh, by the state. Uh, like in Tignes, in Bolivia, or uh, in other, uh, in other uh, scenarios. So, it's not only the question about the sustainability, uh, strong sustainability or, uh, or a weak sustainability, but uh, 
for me, the, 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 the most important question is uh, the frontiers of democracy at the moment. Thank you. So, what's your. First of all, um, I'm very grateful for your uh, comments and on your warning, you know. So, the three donors, I'll mention them, uh, two bilaterals and one multilateral. Um, in many activist and civil society uh, circles, they might be called the bad guys. Well, first of all, it's uh, USAID. They're, they're back now. All, everybody but everybody's back in Myanmar. <laughs> and uh, secondly, uh, EU. EU. And thirdly, it's the Swiss, the Swiss Development Corporation. Uh, so, I'm not actually involved in the drafting of the national policy, but my colleagues are. And, you know, the way that things work in a more plural system is that we've had three very disappointing laws in a row, okay? The farmland law, the wasteland law, and the law protecting the uh, the plight of the situation of the farmers, you know, they've been a bit disappointing. So this was in a way seen as a, a way of counterbalancing those laws, you know. And of course, we've never had a, a more holistic uh, land use policy. So this was embarked upon. They've gone through the proper process. I think they went through five drafts, and now we are, I think, maybe at the, the later stages where public consultations are carried out. Civil society has taken different positions on this, you know, to be fair. And I think uh, there's a lot of unhappiness with the uh, draft as it stands. But what I say is that it can be improved upon. We can invite inputs and it's still a work in progress. Uh, we cannot be sure whether the final product will be satisfactory or not. You know? But I think uh, the uh, donor organizations do, uh, for instance, particularly the World Bank, has really been, uh, I think, uh, learned from their earlier bitter experiences, like in Cambodia. Uh, World Bank is under great pressure in Myanmar from civil society. So I think, uh, like I said, it's still a uh, work in progress, and we shall see, uh, wait and see what the end product will be. Um, on the multicultural democracy model, I think uh, a, few, a couple of years back, uh, a colleague of mine talked about uh, the Bolivian experience, the Bolivian model to audiences in Myanmar, and there was a great deal of interest. You know? But of course, uh, where Myanmar is concerned, uh, uh, Bolivia is on another continent, uh, literally on the other side of the world, and so we have to see how applicable it would be. You know? But having said that, I would say that now, we talk about Myanmar being very uh, multi-ethnic, multicultural. We talk about now uh, falling back sometimes upon customary law. So. Many of our ethnic groups follow customary law and their customs when it comes to land, for instance. So why can't we have a similar approach to democracy? Now, we could see what is happening in Myanmar is that it's, what's being imposed is that one size fits all uh, democratic party model. You could call it the uh, uniformization of democracy. You know? And I think, well, after I return to Myanmar, I'll be meeting with a lot of ethnic parties, as I usually do, and I will be mentioning this, you know, that, uh, of course, it won't come immediately, but if the present one size fits all, well, it's a replica of all the major parties, you know, of, of the democratic party, and if that could be perhaps merged, integrated with a more, I think, a customary model of governance, you know, perhaps it might be a better alternative. Um, you know, many of our ethnic groups, they have um, very participatory, quite a number of them are hierarchical, but many of them are also, they have participatory models of, of local governance. So I think this is something that is very much a worthwhile trying, that we should not always emulate the, the, the earlier models, you know, which, well, I think bitter experiences shown many times that are not very conducive to our our local conditions. For instance, you know, having these very hierarchical, almost uh, Leninist parties, you know, where the people at the top, and then we have uh, a central executive committee, and all the decisions are made there. So I think that's a very uh, valid uh, comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. So
Please, very briefly. <laughs> so first of all, I would like to um, to stress that I, that I agree with um, my Stella Swampa's remark concerning the territoriality and the, the importance of power relation. So I think uh, when we talk about uh, territorialities and different forms of those territorialities, how they are configured and how they they relate to another superposed or in in a process or of, of succession, then the, the motor of all that and all the motor of those processes is exactly the un, uh, are unequal power relations, and therefore it is certainly the most important point in that. Concerning the question about global financial crisis and its um, impact on the resource issue. Um, I'm very interested to see how the land issue is related to that, and um, it is not. E I think it is not very easy to really, um, uh, yeah, uh, say that it is an, 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 an uni, uni, let's say, an, a logical or an, an exact cause for for that. But you can observe that uh, new forms of land relations of land renting, of land purchase, and so, increase in those regions of uh, agribusiness, for instance, so in the Mato Grosso area. But when you ask, and we did that um, in, a, in a field work uh, in February of this year, but when you ask for, for, to, to understand what happens, it is, I think, methodologically very, very complicated to, to see what really happens, because a land um, uh, land selling processes are always extremely complicated, and um, you have different uh, actors within. And therefore, I would say it is an important question, but for me, it is still not very solved. In which, um, and then there was the first question: um, how I would resolve the question of the multiscolor perspective. Uh, unfortunately, I can't give you an answer. I, I, I certainly cannot resolve that. I, I think what is important for us and, uh, is to consider this idea of the multiscolarity, and there are a lot of, of uh, proposals from uh, 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 important intellectuals from my discipline and other ones. But I think we, uh, we still are trying to, to find um, methods, concepts to, to link these different um, um, scales. Um, I would say what is, so we, we, are, we are trying to, to consider more the idea of transitions. So how you can, how you can um, conceptualize the idea of transition and how in this idea of transition different scales, let's say, how the Dutch people call it from the landscape, that means from a very broad a general discourse level to a more niche level at the ground, how this is interlinked. And I think this is a very interesting idea and it could perhaps be an, an interesting approach um, to come to a better integration of those different um, levels. So that is not an answer, I say, but perhaps it is a hint for a possible future answer. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry that I took some of your uh, coffee break, uh, but I thank you really very much for this uh, very lively, um, lively discussion and your contributions. Uh, Werner is going to have one uh, short announcement. Thank you very much.